So my name is uh, Adit Malik. Uh, um, I am from USA, but currently I'm in uh, South Asia. We're doing fundraising. Uh, that's one of the reasons uh, I am in this uh, region. Um, spent 25 years in California, in uh, Silicon Valley to be Pacific. Um, ran a couple of startups, successful startups. The first was uh, the computer business that we started in uh, 1990, uh, we did that for 15 years. Uh, and then the second business uh, I did, uh, which is uh, the printed circuit board business with my partner, uh, still going on. Um, so those were the two successful ventures uh, I started uh, either myself or with um, one of my partners. Um, beside that, um, we do research on social, economic, and political issues. Uh, we have a small uh, think tank organization, US-based. And then uh, there is an Indus venture through which uh, we do the mentoring of uh, the entrepreneurs. Mostly we go to the incubation centers uh, and the accelerators at the universities. Um, we engage with these students uh, in their senior years uh, to give them the idea about uh, what the entrepreneurship is, if they have a project, if they have a startup. Uh, we work with them basically in four areas, team building, product services, marketing plan, and finance. That includes uh, the fundraising. So, uh, we have a three round. In the first round, we help uh, the incubators screen uh, the startup uh, in the first uh, step. Uh, basically, let's say if about 250 startups apply for the incubation, which is uh, about four or four and a half months. Um, we bring it down to 10, we shortlist them. And then uh, in the second uh, process, we do a SWOT analysis of both the founders and the company to see where they stand, where they need the help. And then uh, in the third round, what we do is um, uh, we get them ready for the funding. Uh, we help them with the um, funding deck uh, that includes usually the seven dots, the one pager, the business plan as short as possible. As you know, investors are getting a lot of, uh, um, you know, requests for the funding. So we want to make sure that uh, their elevator pitch uh, is good. Uh, their business plan is sound. Uh, we also look at their projections, the five-year projection. And then uh, on the legal side, we provide them a little bit of a, um, a idea about what the term sheet or the agreement between the investor and uh, the startup uh, looks like. So this is what we do uh, with the startups. Um, we also emphasize on one thing that uh, you know previous uh, speaker was talking about, which is the trust. Um, as you know, um, there was a study from the Harvard to what they were saying is that the trust basically depends on a couple of things. The honesty and the second thing is uh, the confidence, uh, whether that person is able to uh, do uh, what that person um, is trained for. Um, but then we added the third thing, actually it was added by uh, one of uh, the mentor um, at Uber, I forgot her name, and she added the caring. So basically, in order to build a trust, we found out that uh, you need to make sure that the founding team is honest. Uh, they are competent of what they say that uh, they can do. And the third is, is that they, they are caring. 
Um, unfortunately, in the entrepreneurship business, uh, from the startups to the big corporation, the focus is now on the shareholders instead of the stakeholders. As you know, the stakeholders, you can include uh, your supplier, your customer, your employees, and you can also include, of course, the investors and the environment. So um, there has been too much focus given to the shareholders and that created a lot of uh, uh, inequality that uh, the wealth inequality that uh, you see a lot of people are talking about. And that is a bad thing for the middle class. So for example, China built its middle class from 2000, that was uh, 6% to 50%. Uh, so they practically uh, pulled uh, the poor people from the low income and poverty to the middle class. So 50% of the middle class, that's a very healthy uh, number there. Now in, in the Europe, we know that the middle class uh, um, and also uh, the upper class, um, their, their numbers are pretty good, but uh, it's, it's very bad in America. Uh, I write about that also 42%. It used to be 56%. Um, the, the, the problem there started in the 70s when they um, started focusing on the shareholders instead of focusing on their skilled employee. So this is a little bit of uh, the entrepreneurship and the economy and how the middle class is shrinking, how the wealth is getting concentrated in very few hands. So I stop here um, for, for your questions uh, and, and any comments. Yeah, thanks, David. And I didn't realize that you're involved in the, so many different things uh, from your profile. It sounds super interesting. And uh, maybe there's even a potential for us to collaborate, right? If you're uh, interested in helping a, a teenager entrepreneurs uh, get started yeah. with their own business, that's one of our plans. And the uh, the stakeholder approach to capitalism is something that uh, Klaus Schwab from the World Economic Forum has been uh, claiming for a very, very long time. Uh, it became the main topic uh, with the stakeholder capitalism in his uh, last uh, published book. Uh, they uh, had a little bit of a problem in terms of public relations when they started talking about the Great Reset because uh, that conversation was hijacked by people saying that um, we're getting microchips implanted with the vaccines and Bill Gates is going to be controlling all of us <laughs> from our, our head yeah. uh, which is um, sad but not unexpected, right? You know, they do have the ability to cope with bad press as well. But uh, stakeholder capitalism is part of the dialogue of the United Nations, right? You always talk about stakeholders and um, that's um, something that should be propagated um, even down to family levels. Like uh, as a teenager, who are your stakeholders? As in, as a teenager, I would not be in a position to answer that question. Like what do you mean by stakeholders? I right? didn't, the fact that you have lots of interfaces uh, some of them you're giving, some of them you're taking, some of them is both as a hybrid where there's a give and take that is a balance, hopefully, not always, but that should be the intention. And the fact that they are aware of uh, that way to look at the world can be very powerful, right? So that when they're making decisions, they will think about their grandmother being a stakeholder and going like, wow, she's going to be so sad if I drop out from high school, right? You know, what are the consequences you're going to have on the people uh, around your life? And teenagers are not exactly very famous for making great decisions all the time. And having a stakeholder mindset uh, can most certainly uh, help with that. So do you have any comments in uh, terms of how we can um, scale not down, but you know, scale to the level of teenagers, uh, the things that uh, you're working with in terms of uh, stakeholders uh, principally, but also uh, with the venture capital side of your activities. Yeah, well, let's start with the family. Um, uh, in, in, the, in the Asian family, um, it's a very old tradition that uh, you want to you know, invest uh, in your children education. 
And that's a great investment. Um, I remember when I left Pakistan, I went to US in 82. And when I was uh, studying, um, and I asked my father if, uh, um, if I can work and study at the same time, because uh, they do allow you to work part-time and uh, you know, do full-time study. But he said that uh, as long as uh, I have uh, a dollar in my pocket, uh, it's better that uh, you should complete your study. And I think this is the crisis that we are having in the US where family is breaking down and um, the, they are not able to support their children, uh, which is their investment. Um, so maybe there is a fear that when the children grow up, they're gonna abandon their parents. Because uh, as you can see um, in Europe, I, I was you know, reading one of the study that the 50% of the people are living alone. So that loneliness is, is killing us, especially in this, uh, in this virus there. So coming back to the stakeholders, I think the parents are the stakeholders, your friends, uh, your siblings, uh, if you keep good relationship with them, we've seen that 90% of the investment is coming from the friends and family. So if you're starting a business or education or any project that needs the funding, your most trusted source uh, are the people around you and that includes the family. So, uh, I mean, when we say stakeholder, these are the people that uh, the children and the teenager, they spend the time with. Um, and I think uh, the new stakeholder is the media, uh, the internet. Uh, so what they learn from them. So that is also a part of the stakeholder beside your sibling, family, your teachers and your friend. Yeah, that, that's really a, a good point that the internet is in many ways a, a new family member, right? So and uh, it, it comes down to the point you made of loneliness, uh, which is very different from solitude. Solitude is actually something good, right? So you, you're retracting out of choice, not out of obligation, because yeah. you need to reflect. So I live alone in a tiny chalet that is 300 years old uh, this year. I don't know exactly which month, but you know, it, it's a place that um, almost begs for solitude, right? So you're in the countryside and uh, you can go deeper into whatever you're interested in, but I'm never lonely, right? I'm always connected to so many people. And of course, uh, hosting those conferences pretty much makes it impossible for me to feel lonely because I'm having so many uh, great conversations with amazing people. And um, the main point here is choice, right? If you're choosing to do something, it's usually a positive emotion. If you, it's imposing you and you're forced to because of circumstances outside of your control, you feel powerless. And uh, the empowerment element uh, is very key you know, to uh, have a, a healthy mind state. And I think the teenagers right now, they're going through a really hard time because they can't form those social bonds. The ones who are bad at it, they stay bad at it. The ones who are good at it, they really miss it because it was uh, so important in their lives. And they have more than grown-ups to say to try to empower themselves, right? To um, organize an association and have conversations. And now the thing with the uh, apps like Clubhouse is that you can't use it as a teenager. You have to be 18 to get an account. So teenagers don't even have access to an app that uh, has grown from zero to 10 million users in 10 months. It's, it's the fastest ever growth app. And that shows how lonely people are feeling, right? They really have to connect with others. So we need to figure out uh, how we can help teenagers uh, with that process. And I'm sure that you know the governments and the schools are doing the best that they can, but uh, they need all the help that they can get to. Yeah, absolutely, you're right. And, and, I, and I think the balance is important. Um, they've done the study that uh, if you spend less than an hour or half hour, um, the anxiety goes up, but, it, but also on the other hand, if you spend more than four hours uh, consistently on the social media, that also brings in the uh, depression there. So 
there is, and also it, it depends on what you're doing when you are on the internet. Uh, there, there is a positive aspect of it. There is a negative aspect of it. So the balance needs to be there in face-to-face uh, -face socialization um, with your family, with your friends, uh, spending time online, you know, and talking to people, listening to news and, and uh, all that information there, and also having fun. Um, I mean, as you know, because of the COVID, uh, in Netflix is doing very well. Uh, people are watching movies on the internet there. So that's, that's uh, you know, another way to have uh, a, a good entertainment there. Um, and then your profession, uh, if you're studying, um, you must be spending a balanced time with your homework and about your career if uh, you are employed, of course, you know, the business there. So these are the four things. Actually, when I joined, uh, I would recommend uh, that um, these uh, teens should think about joining. There are a couple of business organizations. And when I was joining WEO, World Entrepreneurship Organization, uh, it's called EO now, Entrepreneur, uh, Entrepreneurs Organization. And uh, they had four objectives. And I was surprised that uh, they're talking about the family uh, in their business model. So there were four things that they were talking about, the business, family, community, and self. What you're calling is a, is a solitude that you should spare some time for the self-reflection, you know, being alone, taking care of your health, uh, reading a good book or, you know, yeah, having some, something positive for yourself or even exercising. So, so these are the four areas uh, we need to be in a balance. You're right. Yeah. yeah, well, thanks for that. And the other point I'd like to make, um, if you have a few minutes uh, still, is uh, how can we help more teenagers get on the path to entrepreneurship? Because um, typically accelerators are looking for those who are already in the last two years of university, they have started something, friends and family and fools have been investing in them. And um, and the accelerator is a path towards uh, some seed funding uh, and hopefully some uh, you know, recurring revenue that can justify uh, larger investments. But one of the things that we're trying to do with Wisdom Accelerator is some sort of a phase two, right? Other than you know, live meetings in places like Davos and the online sessions and the podcasts and the clips that comes out of it um, would be uh, uh, what I'm calling the, the Wisdom Fleet. And it's a fleet because it has three ships, like mentorships. We already have a few of our participants being mentored by uh, speakers. The next one that we discussed today, in fact, in the session is internships, right? Uh, so uh, uh, one of uh, our speakers who is a, a luxury concierge uh, in Japan, he could definitely work with teenager uh, interns that are doing market research and they're reaching out and everything else. And the third uh, ship that is the one that uh, you know, fits in your harbor uh, in the Indus River, I guess, or the the new harbor that has been built in Pakistan, uh, close to Karachi, um, it, that would be a Gawadar, right? It's called the uh, the joint venture of China. Yeah, yeah, Gawadar. Gawadar. Correct. So the the entrepreneurship is uh, the one that is a really good fit to what you're doing, and I'm really curious to know uh, how we would you see some sort of a micro VC structured being managed by existing funds that are willing to do that not for the money or for the returns because that's quite unlikely but more for the pr aspects and the pay forward uh, giving back uh, perspective as well so do you think it's realistic to tell teenagers from the ages of 16 or so that if they have an idea and they need to have a check for a thousand five thousand ten thousand uh, dollars you would have um foundations doing those as a grant, but even VC saying, look, we expect some of those to become extremely successful uh, in the future. So we're willing to lose money on 90 out of 100 investments because the, the final 10 are going to pay you know, everything 10 times over. Uh, and how do you think that this could happen if you think it's a, a feasible idea? Yeah, um, what I, my experience is uh, uh, 
talking to, to a lot of people, especially the young people that I usually work with, is that uh, the first thing that they ask is the money there, but, but that's, that's not the big issue. That's a secondary issue uh, because the people who wants to invest, they, they look at uh, the uh, entrepreneur idea, uh, his passion, his uh, achievement that he has done. So um, first of all, if this is a family business, uh, we recommend that the child shadows the father or the mother, whoever is in business uh, at the age of seven. Uh, I'll give you the example of my brother-in-law. Uh, he has a glue factory uh, in Pakistan, very successful. And he started going to the factory, of course, after the school at the age of seven. So, uh, so this is very radical age uh, that you start the entrepreneurship. But, but th this is the advantage for the children who, whose parents are already in the business. I think what you're talking about uh, is about the children whose parents are not in business and they want to go in business. Yeah. Uh, for them, yeah. For them, I think uh, the best way to do that is that they should uh, do the internship at an early age. Um, sometimes uh, what the parents do is uh, if their friends are in business, they ask their children to go and spend summer in their friend's business. We have done that in Kansas City uh, and also in California successfully. So um, my take is, uh, is that, uh, of course, the money is important, but the time is more important. So when these kids uh, spend time with their parents or uh, somebody that they know, their mentor, uh, the, the earlier, the better. Uh, and they are very mature when they get into a business. Uh, uh, they have a lot of confidence. Um, and, and, and also, if they're not going to get into business, I have seen um, in Pakistan, unfortunately, there is a, a child labor uh, issue in Pakistan. Um, but when I see those uh, 12, 13 year old children, and when I see the children of those wealthy people uh, in Pakistan, there, there, is a, there is a huge difference. They have low self-confidence in the rich family, but in the poor family, these kids, when they start working at a, uh, at a lower age, I'm not recommending that you know, they should do that. Um, but sometimes uh, these kids have a uh, great confidence, even though they are not that educated, but uh, they have the skills. So sometimes the skills matters. Um, there, there are a lot of people in Pakistan, they didn't go to college and university, but, but they are the very successful business people there. So the combination of uh, the book and the street smartness, what we call is a uh, the combination of the book smart and the street smart, uh, that is the best thing, uh, that you, sh you should have the skill and also you have the knowledge uh, that you took from the university. So um, to, to make the long story short, um, we, we start as early as possible. Uh, investment is good, but uh, uh, my idea is, and the people that I usually work with, is that let that entrepreneur sweat a little bit uh, before the money comes in. Oh, that's for sure. I mean, I'm, I'm just uh, thinking uh, uh, combined with starting mentorships from ages 13, 14, yeah. then having internships age 16, and you're working, uh, let's say, for a clothes factory and you have an idea uh for your own clothesline and that requires buying materials right so uh, if you can show that look i started getting mentored uh, when i was 13 i really cared about you know becoming wiser faster from a young age i started getting an internship as soon as i could and now i have this idea but i need the money to make it happen uh, of course you should go to friends and family and all that but i i think it's extremely motivating even if the amount of money being made available is really tiny it's external validation right so when you have 
an, inv an angel in this case, and most likely a very kind angel saying, look, no, you need to, you're in Pakistan and you need to buy materials, a sewing machine, you need to pay um, right. uh, to do your super cool LED electric t-shirts that are going to be selling uh, via Etsy all around the world. Here's a thousand dollars that uh, we're giving to you and here are the conditions for you to pay back. And uh, yes. it needs to be done in a way that it's not going to trap uh, the teenager into debt. Uh, most likely the entrepreneurship um, level will be from the age of 18 when they can sign contracts themselves, but really only for those that have been doing internships for two years and they're very, very clear on what they're trying to achieve, right? And of course, friends and family should be the first ones uh, supporting them. But I, I do believe that having a professional organization saying, we believe in you, it's very powerful, right? It's going to be not only motivating, but it's going to be getting them access to an ecosystem that friends and family cannot offer. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. I think uh, like a scholarship system where the company, uh, they offer the scholarship to the students, there should be a kind of an entrepreneurship scholarship that you're talking about, a, a small amount of money to encourage the entrepreneurship uh, at the early age. By the way, at the incubation center that I usually work with, they have the stipend. So they give a monthly stipend to these entrepreneurs instead of, um, in addition to providing them the space and the uh, other support there. So I agree with you, a small investment goes a long way. Yeah, so we are happy to discuss. I mean, this is a, a very incipient idea. No, I, I think the mentorship is the easiest, right? To have uh, hundreds of speakers now from all around the world will be asking your speakers to run a mentorship session. So uh, a commitment of maybe one hour a month, like booking the session, and then you know, teenagers from all around the world can come and learn about strategic planning and uh, you know, fundraising, whatever topic the speaker uh, wants to cover. Uh, but that's most likely the one we're starting with. And then the internships, so we also want to get started with a few of those, at least a test as a pilot. And entrepreneurship will be a little bit later, but because it does take a long time to structure, you know, the, the more advice I can get from people uh, with your background, the, the better it is. So you, your help and support is much appreciated uh, once again. Yeah, exactly. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. You yeah, have a good day. Thank you so much. All the best.